Hi guys, how's it going? Today I thought I'd put on a tutorial on some drawing tips or things that have helped me throughout the years. Now, when people say they can't draw, that was me. I, I could not draw. I still feel like I'm learning a lot. It took me a long time and a lot of practice to get to where I am today. And I'm hoping that some of the techniques and exercises I'm going to show you today will help you get to learn how to draw, at least a little bit. You can always check me out on Twitch. I stream all the time and you can ask me questions in person. I would love to see you there if you want to stop by. Uh, links in the description below and all that. So for today's tutorial, I'm going to use Microsoft Paint because I want to show that it doesn't matter what kind of software you have, whether it's pencil, paper, Photoshop, Clip Studio Paint, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can follow along with these exercises no matter what you're using. When I open up Microsoft Paint and I want to do these art exercises, usually what I'll do is there's a little slider down here where your magnification is. You can just drag that all the way to the left and then you can drag your canvas so it's nice and long like that. I like a nice long canvas. So now whenever I do my drawing exercises, if I fill up a whole page, all I have to do when I want a new page is just scroll over horizontally and I've got a new blank piece of paper to work with. So that's all I'm going to be using for this entire video. Now you saw me do one drawing exercise, but let me show you some other drawing exercises that help. And the reason we do these is because when people first learn to draw, a lot of times you see stuff like this. You see like these really hairy, like just careful lines when you're drawing things. So if this is you, if you're doing this, stop, stop doing this. Um, we want to build line confidence. We want to zip, zop, we want to zoop, zop, zippity bop all around the page. We don't want to be like that. We want some line confidence. So that's why we do these drawing exercises. The first exercise I'd recommend doing is drawing a point on one side of your paper and then a point on another side of the paper horizontally. And take your pencil and don't draw from one point to the other yet. Do a couple practice swings. Treat it kind of like baseball. So we're drawing from one point to the other, but we're doing invisible strokes. And then when we're feeling ready, when we're feeling confident, lay down that line and repeat. Do the same thing. Two more dots next to each other. Couple practice swings. Zip. Just get that line from one point to the next. And just try to do it as straight as you can, just like that. So the objective we're trying to do is to just practice drawing straight horizontal lines. Are they perfect? No, but that's why we practice it. Another thing to keep in mind when you're doing these is you want to draw with your whole arm. You don't want to draw with your wrist. That's how you get like very wiggly lines, kind of like that. That's me drawing with my wrist. Whereas if I use my shoulder, if I draw from my shoulder, it's more like that. And we are literally going to go this entire page. I'm not going to stop until I'm all the way at the bottom. That's my goal. If I see myself getting sloppy, that's a good sign to slow down and try and be more careful. It's very meditative. Things like this you could do anywhere. You could do this at a bus stop, in an Uber, or just in a park during your lunch break. All right, so we just finished the whole page. So that's the horizontal line practice. Can you guess what the next practice might be? We're going to go vertical this time. So same thing, a dot above and below, a couple of practice swings, and zip. And what this teaches you is, again, to draw with your whole arm. Don't draw with your wrist and make all those hairy, unconfident lines. We're trying to do this so often that we feel comfortable just laying down one big, confident stroke. Go fast enough that you're confident, but not so fast that you lose control, and not so slow that it gets wiggly. Is it boring? Maybe. I'm having fun, though. And there we go. There's our horizontal and our vertical lines. Are they perfect? No. But that's not the point. We're not trying to make perfect drawings here. We're just trying to build up our muscle memory with how to draw big, confident strokes here. So the next exercise might be a bit more fun. Do you have trouble drawing these? I know I um have trouble drawing them. Circles are pretty hard. So with circles, again, you want to draw from your shoulder and just take a couple of practice swings and then lay down your circle. Go next to it and try to do the same thing. Zoop. And usually for circles, I'll go over them about three times, just like that. That helps me um, get a little bit more of a refined circle when I'm doing it. And when I'm doing these bubble pages, I'm trying to make them connect at these points. 
So that's the objective, is to draw circles next to each other, but you want to draw them in such a way that they connect with the other circles. Just like that. And try filling just a whole page with um, circles. Try and draw them as best as you can. So doing pages like this will help you immensely with drawing circles. And the more sketchy they are, the more like rough they look, you know, that means you need a little bit more practice. I'm talking about myself here. But if they look like you're going over the same stroke over and over again, and it's indistinguishable that there's multiple strokes in there, that means it's looking pretty good. Just like with the lines, you're practicing going to certain points. You're practicing making lines connect with each other and going and putting the line where you want it to go. You'll also notice I'm not pushing undo during this whole exercise either. I'm living with my mistakes. Maybe a life lesson in there. <laughs> but um, I treat it just like drawing with pen. And in fact, when you're doing these, I would encourage you to draw with pen. We'll go over that more later. So there we have a whole page of bubbles. So if you want to practice circles, this is a really great way to do it. So those are the three art drawing exercises I'd recommend doing. That should be enough to get you started with line confidence. There's plenty of art exercises out there to look up. Uh, if you get bored with those ones, look up a different one. Moving on to the next topic is how to draw basic shapes. You can see how sloppy that is, so let's try it again. Trying to make each line straight and also the same size as every other line. And again, repeating these will just help make it a lot easier to draw moving forward. This seems rudimentary, but I promise you we're going somewhere with this. So if you can, follow along and just draw a row of squares just next to each other. Okay, next shape, let's do some triangles. So again, all equal sides, every side should be equal. And just try to draw as perfect triangles as you can. All right, so there's our row of triangles. Again, I'm just doing one row, but make however many you want or as few as you want. And then the next one, you practice this one a lot. Let's do some circles. And again, these are small, but I'm still drawing with my arm. And try to make them as perfect as you can and as much the same size as each other as you can. And there's a row of circles. So where can we take this after this? Well, now we can learn how to make them 3D shapes. The first one is going to be cubes. So before we can draw 3D shapes, we need to talk about perspective a little bit. So with perspective, the first point that we're going to have is your eye level. So this is either called your eye level or your horizon. And then if you're doing one point perspective, we're going to have one point in the center called the vanishing point. So if we just take our line tool and just draw radial lines coming out from that vanishing point like this. Okay, so one point perspective. Does it remind you of anything? Perhaps if we drew some lines coming out like this and then drew some little planks going into the distance like this. Perhaps it looks a little bit like if you've ever stood on train tracks, which is very dangerous, don't do that. But if you look at train tracks going off in the distance, then you've seen what one point perspective looks like. This is the simplest form of perspective. So a cube is very easy, especially if we put it smack dab in the center. We're gonna draw our square, which we've practiced before, so that should be no problem. And we're done. <laughs> Literally, that's all you would see if a square, if a cube was sitting in one point perspective in front of you. But let's draw the insides of that cube. So the insides are going to be following these vanishing point lines right here. So the thing about one point perspective, your X lines and your Y lines are always straight. Those are always straight. The only ones that are going to follow the vanishing points are your Z or your depth lines. So if we were drawing hallways, for example, the only things that would be going towards the vanishing point are things that would be going back in depth. So for our cube, let's draw a smaller cube in the center here, or a smaller square rather, and just draw some dots from one corner to the other, which should follow the vanishing point. And that should give you a visual representation of what a 3D cube looks like. If we were to draw a cube up over here, again, remember that all vertical and horizontal lines are going to be straight in one point perspective but everything going back in depth is going to go towards that vanishing point. And then again, the outside edges are going to be straight. Let's try drawing a cube over here. So something to keep in mind is you don't want to make these too long. You don't want to make them obviously a rectangle. We are trying to make them as cube-like as possible. So just use your observational skills and just ask yourself, does it look like a perfect cube? Does it look like a perfect square from all different corners? So that's how to draw a cube in perspective. And one thing to notice about perspective is anytime a line is going back in space, it gets smaller. So if I were to draw a cube incorrectly, it might look a bit something like that. 
So that's incorrect, right? Because these lines are all getting bigger as they go back in space, when really what they should be doing is getting smaller as they go back in space. So when you're practicing drawing freehand cubes, that's something to definitely keep in mind. So for freehand cubes, as long as the edges are all getting smaller as they go back in space, and it looks vaguely cube-like, you're doing it right. So we'll draw some freehand cubes here, just as practice. Again, another thing that you can draw just anywhere, and it's very good practice to do. One thing that helps me to draw cubes from these kind of corner angles is to draw a Y shape, kind of like this. And it helps you to kind of figure out what the rest of the cube should look like. Again, just making sure that all those lines get smaller as they go back in space. And there are some cubes that you can practice. Once you can draw these confidently on your own, you're doing very well. The other shape I want to go over is how to do cylinders in 3D. So a cylinder at its very basic is super duper easy. I'm going to draw it below the vanishing point so that way you see the top of the cylinder. So to draw a 3D cylinder, just draw an oval like this, and then draw two parallel lines, and then draw the same oval on the bottom, but when you get to the point where it's going inside the cylinder, draw it as a dotted line. Since we can't really see this side, it's like we're looking through it, like it's um, a cup or something. So that's what a cylinder would look like if you're looking at it from above, like this. And if I draw the cylinder above the vanishing point, it would look like this. So if you're looking underneath the cylinder, kind of like this, with it being above the vanishing point, it would look like that. And if it's directly on the vanishing point, if you're just looking at it straight on, you may realize that the floor of the cylinder here is below the vanishing point, right? And then the top of the cylinder is above the vanishing point. So we can't see the top either. We're just looking at it from the side, just like this. So that's what a cylinder would look like above, below, and right on the vanishing point. So back on our practice page, let's draw some cylinders. Let's draw some cylinders that we're looking underneath. And if you use that taper where lines are converging back into perspective, then it looks like it's going back in perspective. Let's try drawing a cylinder from above, a cylinder on its side. And then here I'll demonstrate what a foreshortened cylinder looks like. So if we start rotating the cylinder towards the camera, the circle gets more circular and less oval shape to the point where if you look at a cylinder straight on, it's just going to be a circle. And then if we look at it completely from the side, it's just going to be a flat rectangle. So this is a really important part of foreshortening. This is a really important concept to understand when you're drawing your cylinders is if you're looking at it slightly from the side, it's going to look like this. And then if you're looking at it more from the front, it's going to end up looking more like that. So just try drawing a bunch of tumbling cylinders, just from different angles, different perspectives. This is a very important shape, because it's used a lot in anatomy. Our next shape that we're going to go over in 3D is called the sphere. It's the same shape that our globe is in, unless you don't believe in that. Um, it's also the same shape as a ball. So to do a 3D sphere, we're just going to do that. And then we'll do this and that and there we go <laughs> there's there's our still there's our sphere uh no no there's more i want to show you <laughs> so obviously this is all you can draw as a uh, 3d sphere unless you shade it which we'll get into shading later we're not into shading right now we're just talking about the shapes themselves one thing you can do with a sphere is you can draw a wireframe over it so you may have seen, if you've done any face tutorials, you may see stuff like this, where, you know, they draw a cross on the uh, sphere, and then that means the eyes sit right here, like that, you know, and then eyebrows up here, sort of thing. Nose, mouth. But um, what a lot of people don't realize with this cross thing is they're not following the form, you know, they're just kind of doing like an arbitrary cross shape. This may look a little bit correct, but if we were to continue the shape backwards, um, it's creating these sharp points, which doesn't really happen on a sphere. A sphere is a circle, so all the um, wireframes around it are going to be circular. So if we take a smaller brush like this, and we want to do a proper wireframe, you'd want to think about it more like an oval, like this. And then same for the horizontal, it should be an oval cutting the inside of that sphere. And then if we were to do that cross again, it would look a little bit more like this. So just something to keep in mind. Um, make sure that you're drawing your crosses all the way through. They should be following a ball just like that. 
And one way you can tell if your crosses are following a sphere is if they do a curve right here rather than a straight line like we had before. So something I like to do is actually draw a little bit past like that. So we can take this further, draw another sphere, by drawing more wireframes around our spheres. So again, these should cut through just like circles. So draw all the way through, draw your circle all the way through the shape. And then you can always take a thicker brush and then draw just the outside. And that's how you can draw a wireframe on a sphere. Just something to experiment with, just mess around. If you wanna draw a sphere and then draw some midpoints, I think that's a very good exercise to do. Just sort of shapes like that. If that face is looking up that way, or if you have a face that's facing down this way. So let's draw a few of those on our practice sheet. So I know it would be very easy and tempting to take your circles that you drew before and just copy and paste them down, but we need the practice. So let's draw them all freehand. So spheres, again, I'm just drawing that cross shape and kind of drawing through just to remind myself that these are 3D shapes. I'm also trying to get them pretty much on the midpoint. I'm trying to divide them in half as perfectly as I can. That's currently my goal when I'm drawing these. And you can get really extreme with these as well. Like if we put one going way down like that, same here, we can have it really favoring one side as opposed to the other. And you know, if it's facing dead on towards the camera, it's going to look like that. So now that we know how to do 3D shapes, let's take it one step further by drawing some 3D blobs. You already know how to draw a cylinder and a cube, but what happens if we combine those two? Well, it may look something like this. You'll see we've got a cylinder on top of a cube. So it's not very interesting, but what happens if we draw it more like this? You'll see if we break up those lines like along here, it makes it look a little bit more cohesive, like it's one whole object rather than two separate things on top of each other. So this is a way we can combine two of our 3D shapes or more into a more complex object. Let's do another example. We could do a sphere with a cone sticking out of it like so. Now I'm still imagining that there's these lines here just as if it were a 3D object. You know, these objects don't lose their 3D-ness just because we're not drawing lines. We're still visualizing them. We're just choosing to omit them. And if it's easier for you to draw the lines first and then use your eraser and then erase those lines, go for it. What's another one we could do? How about a cylinder that goes into a sphere? Or maybe let's get really wacky with it and draw a cube connected by a squiggly cylinder into another cube. So something like that. The next thing I would suggest you do is to draw the center lines of these 3D objects. So if you imagine like looking at a toy, how you can kind of see the seam on the toy where it goes down the middle and sort of divides it in half like that. And then we could also take it the other way, divide it in half like that. And we could even do it again this direction. Same on the cylinder, we could do a halfway mark here. And you can see that already makes it look a lot more 3D. So try adding these halfway marks to try and understand how these 3D shapes look in 3D space. And since we've already done halfway marks, we should know how to add these onto our 3D shapes already. It's just combining what we already know with two extra things. Then again, we could divide this cone in half right here, just like that. And the sphere we can divide in half this way. And then same on this cylinder, we can divide in half this direction cubes connected by a tube, we can just draw along the outside of our cylinder just like this. So instead of thinking about drawing specific lines or drawing specific curves, visualize more that you're going around this 3D object. You're not trying to draw lines necessarily, you're trying to just like go over this 3D form. So that's how you do 3D objects with wireframes. Now let's take this a step further, and this part's pretty fun. Just draw some random blobs. Try not to worry too much about what they actually look like. And then once you're done with those blobs, let's try to add a wireframe around them. So again, you want to go halfway in between to start. So I'm seeing that this is probably kind of bulbous here. It'd probably dip down here and come up again towards the middle and then make another bulb at the end here. Same thing going on here. This would be kind of bulbous. Maybe dip down, come up in the middle again, and then make another bulb at the end. And then we can do wireframes going the other way, just like this. We'll follow it all the way from one direction and then do it again from the other direction. So just have fun, try to follow the curve of the 3D object. This may seem meaningless, but I promise you, this is helping you to understand that drawings are not flat 2D things. These are 3D objects that you're putting down on a 2D surface. You could use this technique to draw trees, to draw bushes, to draw explosions. So even though it seems like fun and kind of silly, it's actually a very useful skill to have. 
and then this cone would be in front but it's receding towards the background so I'll have the curves going this way and then here's what I mean by there's no right or wrong I'll use this cone as an example if this cone is going back in space the perspective curves would be following it this direction right if it's going away from you but if I want this cone to go towards the camera, first of all, it would have to sit on top of these other objects here. So I'd erase those a little bit. And then I'd draw the base like this. And then I'd have the curves going the other way. So you can see it's the same shape. We haven't changed anything with the shape, but now it's coming towards you in perspective. Pretty interesting, right? So whether curves are coming towards you or going away from you is part of what makes things feel real. Let's do another blob. Let's do this blob. Looks pretty fun. So I'll just have the seam go out and around like that. I'll have the edge of it be kind of more ovular like that. Follow along the outside. And then I imagine this part's kind of like a warty bit that sticks out, sort of like that. And that would follow the rest of the blob just like that. And then going away from camera this direction. And then add in another seam going this way. And it would disappear along that direction like that. Same here, there'd be a seam right there, and another seam going this way. Okay, and then this one's pretty easy. This is just another tube. So which one do we want to have to be facing towards the camera? Let's start from this spot right here. So we'll just tube it up, have the tube going up and around just like this. Again, not thinking about drawing curves. I'm thinking about this as a 3D object, and I'm just going over the 3D object itself. And then we could have a seam go here along the top like that. And then same with the seam going back the other way. Okay, and for this shape, it's pretty much got to be a cube going this way. This would be the top of it, and then this would be the side, just like that. Cone attached onto it like this and like that. And drawing these wireframes can also help with shading, just like that. All right, last one. Let's have the top of the shape on this one be up here. Let's make it sort of like a weird vase that you might put flowers into or something. Just like that. So draw some 3D blobs of your own. See what kind of crazy shapes you can come up with. So now that we understand how to draw 3D shapes and 3D objects, let's move on to shading. So for shading, we're just gonna start with a simple sphere. And I could do this in Microsoft Paint, but it's not going to look great. <laughs> so I'm going to actually, this is going to be the only exercise we're going to do where I'm actually going to take it into my favorite painting program, Clip Studio Paint, just like this. And then we'll open up Clip Studio Paint. So here's our ink layer right here, right? It's what we copied and pasted from Microsoft Paint. So I'm going to make a new layer and put it underneath that ink layer. I'm going to call the ink layer ink, just to keep things organized. And I'm going to call this layer BG for background. I'm going to turn off the ink layer for now. And I'm going to take like a medium gray tone like this. And I'm going to click my fill bucket and fill it in with just a gray tone, just like that. And then on our ink layer, I'm going to set that to multiply. So what multiply does is it hides all of the white and it just lets the black outline show through. And then I'm going to do a new layer in between for our shading. And the tool I'm going to use for this is airbrush. Now, you might think like, oh, airbrush, oh, it's so basic, it's so bad. And it's not wrong, but I think the airbrush um, deserves a lot more credit than uh, people give it credit for. The airbrush can be very versatile. Um, if I make a very big airbrush brush just like this and then draw super lightly, it gives a really nice, just subtle shading effect. And likewise, if I make my airbrush super duper small, just like this, I can get some really hard lines for doing finer detail work. So we want to figure out where this light is coming from. You know, is it coming from behind the ball, coming forward towards the camera? Is the light coming from the front and below the ball like this? You know, you have to decide where your light source is coming from before you can start shading. Because light coming from different directions is going to affect how you shade your drawing. And these 3D arrows can be a really useful tool to um, indicate where the light is coming from in your drawing. So I'm going to decide to have the light just like that. A really nice shortcut that you can do in painting software like this is you can use a selection tool. I'm going to go to my ellipse selection tool and just make a circle selection where my ball is, just like this. And what that'll do is it'll just keep all of my shadows inside the ball, just like that. So what a lot of people do when they first want to learn shading is they'll shade something sort of like this. It's really dark towards the edge. One way to think about shading is 
you're going to have a core shadow that's a little bit more on the inside of the ball, sort of like this. So let's kind of shade that way. Let's just do our darkest bits right here and leave that outer edge just a little bit lighter. And you could do this with pencil too. That's also how I learned how to shade this way was actually shading this way with a pencil. And there we have our shadow for our sphere. Now, obviously, this is going to be casting a shadow onto the ground. So what we can do with our selection is go to select and then invert selected area. And then that'll allow us to paint anywhere where our ball is not. Again, same thing, right? Like most people, when they do a shadow, they do something like this. Just make it super dark right next to the ball. But that's not really what a shadow does. It's going to have bounce light. So to refine this a little bit, we can take our eraser tool and just add a little bit of lightness right where that bounce light is going to be. And then also fade out the edges so it's not so dark. And an important thing to note is the shape of your shadow should be the same shape as the object that's casting it. And there we have our shadow for our ball. Looks pretty good. So now that we have our shadows, depending on what material <laughs> the ball is made of, we're just going to say it's made from something fairly shiny. So it's got to have a highlight, right? So I'm going to make a new layer above our shadow layer. And I'm going to start with a fairly small airbrush tool with pure white. And I'm just going to figure out where that light is directly hitting the ball and just add a spot highlight just like that. And you can see when I zoom out, that makes it sort of look like a cue ball, right? Like from pool. But what I like to do is to take a really large airbrush afterwards and just kind of soften it a little bit. And that sort of smooths out that highlight a little bit. And there's our highlight. You can use these same concepts with no matter what you're painting. You could try this with a cylinder, with a cube. And that same core shadow concept as well as bounce light is going to apply to pretty much no matter what shape you're drawing. And there we go. There's our shaded ball. So now that that's done, let's return to our old pal Microsoft Paint. Good old Microsoft Paint. So now we know how to draw 3D objects and how to shade them and think about form and light. Let's move on to something really fun, something that I really enjoy doing. Let's do some figure drawing. This isn't going to be by any means a comprehensive figure drawing tutorial. There's just way too much to go over. But I'll go over some really basic forms that you can use to do your own figure drawing. One website that I like to use for figure drawing is quickposes.com. Just go over to this timed practice over here on the left, and then you can select anything you want to draw. You can choose faces, hands, people, nude, not nude, and you can also choose the time you want each photo to be displayed for. If you're just starting out, I would really recommend sticking to about three minutes or two minutes per drawing. You don't want to get caught up in details when you're doing these figure drawings. So I'm going to see what figure might be good to draw from, and we'll kind of go through and see what might be a good pose to pick. Okay, so I think I've got a couple poses that'll be good to draw from. All right, let's get it out of our systems. <laughs> She's naked. <laughs> All right, it's a human body. Everyone has one. Get over it. Okay, so now that we've got our model, let's go over some things that I think about while I'm figure drawing. So the very first thing that I think about is line of action. What is line of action? Well, Preston Blair the animator describes the line of action as an imaginary line extending through the main action of the figure. So you can think of this as, let's say, a character's running. So their line of action might look something like this. And then if we draw the character on top, just like this, it's a really good example of line of action. You can see where that character is moving towards because of it. It applies to cartoons, but it also applies to real life as well. You know, it could also apply to someone who's very sad or depressed. Even though they're not moving much or doing much, they still would have a line of action to it. It would just be more droopy, just like this. Oh, he's so sad. So, so sad. A little rain cloud. <laughs> it also applies to standing poses. Most people, when they stand, don't stand like this. They don't stand just perfectly symmetrical, just shoulders exactly horizontal, hips exactly horizontal, waiting for the bus, like, oh, just perfectly symmetrical. Most people don't stand this way. Most people are favoring one foot or the other. It usually looks something more like this. And you can see it in our model here. So the shoulders may tilt this direction, and then the hips may tilt in this direction. So you get something that looks like this. So you get this nice offset of things. It makes things feel a lot more natural. And also one very important thing to note, when the hip is going up in a direction, that is the leg that is going to be bearing all the weight. So the leg that is bearing all the weight is going to be directly under their center of balance most often, unless they're walking, moving, or off balance, or falling. 
So if you take a line and draw it from the pit of the neck, which is that little divot in between your collarbones, and then draw it straight down, you can see where the center of balance is. So on our model, it's right in between her feet right here. So because the hip is going up on this section, this leg is going to be going straight down just like this, directly underneath our figure. And because that leg is supporting the weight, the other leg can kind of do whatever. It could even stick out over here, or you know, it could even go up here if they've got really good balance. But on a standing pose, you could just have it next to the other foot just like this. And then for the arms, and one thing for limbs in general, I really don't like seeing this. I don't like seeing this kind of construction. Uh, you see it in a lot of like, how to draw superheroes kind of books, where it's like just a ball, straight line, and then a ball, straight line. I vehemently hate this kind of construction. If I seeing you do this. If I see you do this, just kidding, draw however you're comfortable drawing. But, um, you know, bones aren't straight like that. Like, if you look at human bones, they've got curve and rhythm to it, you know? So try just adding a rhythm to your arms, you know, something more like this. Especially on female figures, this can be a really nice way to draw arms and legs, too. This sort of rhythm applies to most body parts throughout the figure. So that's line of action. Let's move this all over and we'll move on to some construction. So with this figure, again, same thing. I'm going to think about the line of action first, which you can really see in this pose. Something about like that. And then the next thing I do is I'll sort of see the angle of the shoulders and the angle of the hips, which is going pretty much like this. And then with figure drawing, there are three main volumes. You got the head, rib cage, and the hips. So I'll show just some really basic ways to draw these things. Again, not a comprehensive tutorial by any means, and also there's a million billion different ways to draw all these three body parts. So for the head, I kind of think of it like an egg. So it's sort of just an upside down egg with the uh, widest part of the egg on top. And then if we draw our dividing lines like we were drawing earlier, just like that, the eyes sit just below this middle line here, eyebrows above, nose is about halfway, between the eyes and the chin. And then the mouth is two thirds up. So if you divide this in thirds, the mouth is about two thirds up, just like that. And then the ears on the side of the head go from the eyebrows to the bottom of the nose. These are very typical measurements. Everyone's head is different. So use your observation skills. For the rib cage, there's a bunch of different ways that I draw the rib cage. And I think the way I'm going to show you guys today how to draw the rib cage is sort of a cylinder that's wider on the bottom and a little bit narrower on top. And then the rib cage also has this V shape cut out of it, sort of like this. So that's one way you could draw the rib cage. You could also use the egg shape again. If you draw an egg that's wider on the bottom and have it facing up this way and then just cut out a little V shape, sort of like that. So whatever feels most comfortable to you. So cylinder or egg. Really experiment. Try other people's techniques. You know, don't just follow mine. Use mine with a grain of salt. So the reason we have the rib cage facing up this way is because if we look at the human body from the side, here's the skull and then here's the neck, the rib cage actually faces out like this. So the rib cage here points upwards, and that's why we have our rib cages when we draw them facing upwards, typically, depending on the perspective. And then for the hips, I typically like to use two dinner plates. For women, they're going to be wider and shorter, like this, and then for men, they're going to be more straight up and down and a little bit more narrow. So you can use the dinner plates method, or you can also draw it as a cube, like this. So you can see we're looking down into the cube, just like this. That's because on the hips, if we continue our spine going this way, our hips are going to be tilted this way. So another way that I've seen people draw it is sort of like if you've ever looked at underwear or like the crotch part of a Ken doll, sort of like underwear. <laughs> I draw it this way a lot. It also kind of helps illustrate where the legs are going to connect into the hips. So I like the dinner plate method. That's the way I started when I was first learning to draw people. So those are the three main volumes. Those are the three things to first start out with when you're constructing your figure. So back to our model, let's start with the three main volumes. Let's start out with putting her hips in there. We'll do the two dinner plate method for this one. So we have her hips here. And then for the rib cage, let's do sort of that egg shape. And let's also do that 
middle dividing line so we can tell that the rib cage is facing up this direction like that and i might have put the um rib cage a bit far from the hips i tend to do that and these two things tend to be a lot closer than how i typically draw them just something to be aware of um and then the head is just an egg shape draw in our dividing line Okay, the next let's do her legs. So the measurement for legs is typically going to be about the same length as the top of the head to the bottom of the crotch. So let's take that measurement and duplicate it. So her legs are going to be about down here. So about half of that is where her knees are going to be. So for knees, I usually draw just a V shape just like that. So I'm going to start with the weight bearing leg and we're going to draw her thigh as a cylinder that's wider at the top and narrower towards the end, just like this. And if I were to draw wireframes over it, it would look something like this. So that's her thigh. And then the shin is sort of like an upside down bowling pin. So if we draw another cylinder that's wider like a bowling pin at the top and then narrows towards the ankle and then add in our wireframe just like this going that direction. And then for the feet, I'm just going to draw just a simple triangular shape, just like this. So there's one leg. Let's draw the other. So this leg's coming towards the camera, right? You remember how I was saying cylinders that are straight facing the camera? You don't even see the tops and the bottoms. It would just make a rectangle. Whereas a cylinder, if it's facing towards the camera, would really round out, you know, and you'd see a lot more curve. So that's what's going on here. So it's kind of wrapping around like this. This is called foreshortening. So when things come towards the camera, they get foreshortened. And foreshortening is notoriously difficult, but if you break things down into simple shapes, it makes it a lot easier. So again, let's uh, draw a cylinder for her thigh coming this direction, just like this. Draw the end of the cylinder like that. Put in our wireframe. Draw her knees as a simple V shape. And then the shin for this one, again, it's just going to be a bowling pin that's been turned upside down but still pretty much cylindrical in shape. And then it's going away from the camera, right? So the wireframes would be more like that. And then again, for the foot, I'm just gonna do very simple triangular shape, just like this, and then add the heel onto it, just like that. If you want, you can add a couple toes just by adding the big toe as one block and then the little toes as another block. It can be a really easy way to simplify toes. Typically for the arms, I like to draw the entire shoulder girdle. So if I have my head on top like this, and then I've got my rib cage down here, sort of like that. Then the way I draw the shoulder girdle is sort of like an arrow shape, like this. So the neck would come down like this from the skull, come out, and then form sort of an arrow down just like this. And what these parts here represent are your collarbones. And then the muscles of the neck form sort of a V-shape that connects into that spot. It's sort of um, an all-encompassing tool. You get your neck, you get your trapezius muscles back there, and you get your collarbones. And the reason I start there is because the shoulders are attached directly underneath where your collarbone goes back into your scapula. So your shoulder joints are going to be directly underneath these things, just like that. On our model here, it's going to look something like this. Now it's more extreme because her arms are going up, so you're not going to see as much of the shoulder girdle because the arms are covering a lot of it. But her neck would look something like that, and then the shoulders would be up here, and then this one looks like it's about down there. And then for this first arm, we're just going to do a cylinder that's narrower towards the elbow and wider where the, um, the shoulders are. It looks like it ends just above her head, just like that. Throw in some wireframes for good measure. And then the elbow is sort of just a sharp angle, just like that. And then the forearm's going to be wider at the elbow and then narrow into where the wrist is going to go. So just like that. And then the hands you don't really see here. And hands are such a huge topic that we wouldn't be able to cover them anyway. But we'll simplify them as really simple triangle shapes for now. If you'd like to learn more about any of these body parts, leave a comment down below. And I'd be happy to consider making a video if you'd like to go more in depth on any of these body parts. For this other arm, again, same thing. It's going to be wider at the shoulder and then narrow towards the elbow, just like this. Make another cylinder shape. Throw some wireframes on, just like that. And then a sharp corner for the elbow. And then for the forearm, it's wider at the elbow and then it narrows towards the wrist. So narrow cylinder goes into a wider tapered cylinder, just like that. And then this hand, we're just going to draw a square for the palm. And then little triangles for the fingers, just like that. Okay. 
And then for the breasts, because we know how to draw spheres, it may be really tempting to just like put two big old spheres right there. But um, that's not how breasts work. Breasts aren't just like two big spheres just plopped onto the rib cage like that. If we were to draw a male figure, they're going to have pectoralis muscles, right? And they just kind of sit sort of like a rectangle like this. And then they also connect to the uh, collarbones just like this. Well, females have the exact same muscles. Imagine that. We're both humans. We both have the same muscles generally. They just take different shapes. So for a female, they're still going to have these pectoralis muscles. But then they have these sacks of fat that hang off the pectoralis muscles, which make the breasts. So if we just erase the pecs a little bit and then just add in the breasts like this. So they're not just spheres that defy gravity. You know, think of them as more like water balloons that are hanging off of these muscles. So they're going to droop depending on gravity, age, build, all that sort of stuff. So if we were to draw wireframes over the shapes, it would look something like this. So you get one part for the pectorals and then another part for where the fat hangs off. And then if we draw wireframes going this way, it sort of gives you an idea how the breasts are actually consistent of two different parts. So you've got the top of the breasts and then the bottom of the breasts. So the top being the pectoralis muscles. And uh, these wireframes can be a good way to indicate where the nipples would go. You could also take a line from the pit of the neck right here and just draw lines going out just like this can be a good way to indicate where um, the nipples would go. Also, um, I see a lot of people use sort of um, an upside down heart shape from the pit of the neck. It can be a really good simplifying tool to use. So you can see on the figure here how the pectoralis muscles are going up and attaching to the arms here. They attach to the collarbones here. And you can't really see because of the sensor bar, but just trust that they're there. But the pectoralis muscles are hanging on top of them and then the breasts hang off of the pectoralis muscles, just like that. So for the breasts, we draw the pectoralis muscle just a little bit, and then the breast on the side, just like that. And then same thing here, pectoralis, and then breast on this side. Then we can erase a little bit, just so we have a clearer notion of what's going on. And then draw in our wireframes, just like that. So there's our breasts. And then for the belly, one useful tool is you can draw an X from the top of the hips to the bottom of the rib cage going crisscross kind of like that, and that'll show you exactly where the belly button needs to go. And then for the waist, usually I do one line here for the rib cage, a line going down for where the belly is, and then a line going out where the hips would be. So if we simplify it, a line down for the rib cage, a line down for the belly, and then a line down for the hips. And then same thing on this side, rib cage, belly, and then hips. And then something as simple as just two lines either side to define the belly, just like that. And then once you've got your figure down, you can sort of just go through and just refine and try and get things looking more appealing, more closer to the model. So now that we've got that, let's move on to the male figure. So for this pose, we're going to follow the exact same steps as we did before. We're going to draw the line of action first, figure out the angles for the shoulders and the hips, and then place in our three main volumes. So again, that's the head, the rib cage. Now on a male figure, typically the rib cage is wider than on females. And then for the hips, we're going to do the two dinner plates. So again, for males, that's typically narrower and taller for the hips. Draw in our midway guidelines, just like that. And then again, we can draw from the pit of the neck all the way down into a straight line. And you'll see that even though he's standing on one leg, the leg that has all the weight is perfectly straight below where his center of balance is. Again, to figure out where the legs are, that's going to be the same length as the top of the head to the bottom of the crutch. We'll copy that measurement and duplicate it down here. Now if we draw his center of balance, his foot should be right about here. So again, we're just going to draw that as a triangular shape. And maybe you'd see a little bit of the heel back here like that. The knees on this guy, I'm going to draw, since he's a little bit more muscular, I'm going to draw his knees kind of like two parentheses on top of each other. And then again, for his hips, it's going to be a cylinder that's wider at the top and then tapers down below like this. And then we draw in our wireframes just to get that sense of 3D volume. So on the shin, there's a straight line that goes from the kneecap down to the foot, kind of to indicate where the shin bone is. And then the muscles on the side are sort of like an upside down bowling pin. And then same on this side. And then on this leg, again, it's foreshortened. It's coming towards the camera. So a cylinder kind of facing away from the camera might look like this, whereas a cylinder facing towards the camera would look a little bit more like this. 
So let's draw our cylinder the same way for that leg. We'll draw it wider at the hips, figure out where the end of it needs to go, and then connect it just like that, and add in our wireframes. And his kneecap is about right here, so we'll draw his shin just like that. Put in our wireframes. Then for the foot, we're just going to add a triangular shape. For his abs, again, you can do a cross from the top of the hips to the bottom of the rib cage, both directions, just like that. That'll give you right where his belly button needs to go. So one way you can think of like torsos bending and twisting and moving is the concept of squash and stretch. So here on this side would be the stretch. And then on the opposite side, you have it bending over and getting compressed, making more of a squash form. So exaggerating that sort of thing can give a lot of life to your drawings as well. So we'll kind of incorporate that into our drawing here. And then for his arms, again, I'm going to start with the shoulder girdle, which is that arrow shape we were talking about before, that kind of shows where the collarbones are going to go. And men typically are going to have a thicker neck. So female necks I usually draw kind of swooping in like that. And then for a male drawing, usually depending on how muscular the person is, I'll usually do something more like this, where the arrows are kind of bulging out in these spots. This is actually your trapezius muscle. So now that we have the shoulder girdle, we know where the shoulder joints need to go, right about there. So let's draw his arm going back first, since that's kind of interesting. So let's draw a cylinder going forward, have it be just like the legs, it's going to be thicker towards the torso, and then thinner once it gets to the elbow for the forearm, just like that, and then his armpit is down in here, just like that. And then for his forearm, it's thicker at the topmost joint, and then it thins out towards the joint at the end. And then for the elbow, just throw in like a sharp corner, just like that. And for the hand, we'll just throw in a square, just like that. Okay, and then again, his forearm coming towards the camera just like this. And it can be helpful to draw these 3D shapes over the top of your figure first and then do them over here on your drawing right afterwards. Kind of helps to cement that visualization of what's actually going on. Draw in our wireframes. And if this is feeling too complicated for you, stay tuned because I'm going to show sort of a quick and dirty method for drawing the figure. This is mostly just to show how I think about constructing people and what kind of shapes I would use now that we know how to draw 3D shapes. And then again, the elbow is just a sharp corner right there. And then his hand over here is sort of square-like. And let's just kind of refine our drawing from our observation. Okay, so now that we have those done, let's do some really quick gestures. So I'll show you how I actually do figure drawing and how I'd recommend you do figure drawing practice at home. So again, I'm using the website quickposes.com. And for these figures, I'm only going to work on them for a maximum of like two minutes, ideally about 60 seconds if you can. So the first thing I'm going to do is line of action, figure out shoulder, hip angles, get the main volumes. So the head, the rib cage, and you can see I'm still doing my center lines because I find that really helpful for making 3D forms. And then my hips lately I've been drawing like this. So if I draw like this, it's pretty much the same thing as the dinner plate method, just a slightly different way of drawing it. And then off of that, I'll attach the legs and then the shoulder girdle. Again, just using that arrow shape. And I draw the shoulder muscle first and the upper arm, lower arm, keeping in mind those same sort of forms I was talking about before with the um, cylindrical kind of shapes, just like that. Hand, if I'm being quick, literally just an angular shape, just like that. You know, if you're drawing the whole body, it's kind of hard to get hand detail in there in such a quick time. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll put the hand first and then attach the forearm afterwards. And again, I'm thinking about these as 3D shapes, just like this. It's just instead of drawing the wireframes out, usually I just have them visually in my mind at this point. But it can be really helpful to draw out these wireframes for the legs and body parts and such. Also, another thing to pay attention to is things like negative space. So see the space in between her arm and her torso. If I think about drawing that negative space instead of thinking about drawing an arm specifically or whatever, it helps kind of abstract it a little bit and actually makes it easier to draw if I'm not thinking about drawing an arm necessarily. Then, you know, if I want to add hair, I can do a general silhouette of her hair. Nose, I usually just do a couple of lines just like that. Eyes, same thing, just like the top of her eyelash. And then her pupil underneath it, mouth, just a couple of lines, keeping it real simple. And her ear would be back here. Let's speed it up a little bit. Let's try to do one a little bit faster. 
So to do a really quick gesture, if something's like 30 seconds long, you know, I'll do line of action, main volumes, got your rib cage, head, hips back here, then have the thighs come out. You can throw in a couple wireframes just super quickly just to get the idea down. And again, just triangle for the hand, little tri triangular mitten, something like that. Throw in your wireframes, maybe a little bit of ear and jaw shape. And again, you want confident lines. You don't want to, um, you want to spend some time looking at what's going on, really process it. Spend more time looking and thinking, almost to the point where it feels uncomfortable, you know? You want to think a lot more about what you draw before you start drawing it. So just something like that. That's about as detailed as I would recommend you get for figure drawing, is just, is just really quick little gestures like that. Let's do another one. So for this pose, again, draw on our egg, get a wireframe looking down, just like that, line of action. And the objective for figure drawing, you're not trying to copy a photo. That's not the objective. The objective is to get an action, um, get an emotion. Things that will be helpful for things like your comic or your animation is capturing an emotion, something that tells a story. What else was I going to say? Oh, also, um, your drawings are going to be bad. Uh, something I always tell myself whenever I do figure drawing is my first drawings are going to be terrible. And the sooner you accept that, the easier it's going to be. They're supposed to be bad. <laughs> That's why it's practice. Don't beat yourself up if things aren't looking the way you want them to. I guarantee every artist you've ever loved uh, goes through the exact same thing and feels the exact same way. For all the drawings that your favorite artist posts, you know, there's a thousand bad drawings that they're not posting online. Also, don't compare yourself to other artists either. The only people you should be comparing yourself to is yourself. Let's do a couple more. And you know, everyone has different techniques. Um, this is just the way I tend to do things. So line of action. Sometimes, you know, I'll draw the torso first as sort of um, a three segmented piece like that. Draw the hips as kind of like underwear, sort of like that. Again, I want to pay attention to what direction my shoulders and my hips are going. Very important for contrapposto and just interesting posing and movement. And if you'd ever like to watch me do this stuff live, I do figure drawing and anatomy studies all the time on my Twitch. Come visit. Come have a good time. Always love answering questions and hanging out with people who are into art and animation. It's always fun. So I would really recommend getting the body down as best as you can before you move on to things like facial details or like hair, unless specifically you want to study that stuff. That's another thing too, is you don't have to draw the whole figure. There's nothing saying that you have to draw the whole thing. If you want to focus on just the face, then do that. You know, focus on the part that you want to focus on. All right, let's see if we can find a lying down pose just to finish it off. I always have trouble with lying down poses. I always tend to make the, um, the torso way too long, so that's something I'm going to try and keep in mind on this pose and try to avoid doing. You know, after you're done with your drawings, it might be a good idea to just lay them over the top of your um your photo reference and just see the parts that are off and just note what to fix for next time. And again, just like a musical instrument, like the more you do stuff and the more comfortable, confident, and better you get at it, the more fun it's going to be. Like, I'm having such a fun time doing these figure drawings, and I remember that not being the case. Um, also, doing these for like 10 minutes a day. If you do 10 um, 60 second poses, if you do that every day, I guarantee you're going to get so much faster and better at these and more confident and more comfortable doing figure drawing. And everyone has 10 minutes. That would That's what I would always tell myself is everyone's got 10 minutes to spare. No matter how busy anybody is, and believe me, I get real busy, everyone's got 10 minutes that they can spare. And 60 second poses, there's no way to get bored. Um, you know, they're over before you know it. And there we go. Like I said, I'm not an expert at this figure drawing stuff. I'm still learning so much. 
But yeah, hopefully this was helpful to you. If you'd like to download the example Microsoft Paint illustration that we've done today, you can check it out in the video description below. If you'd like to see more tutorials, make sure to subscribe. Um, like the video if you'd want to share it with other people. Liking the video helps the channel out a lot. This was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing this. And um, with that, I think that's going to be it. Uh, let me know what else you'd like to learn next in the comments section below. And until next time, uh, take care, appreciate you, and bye-bye. Uh,